What defines the look of ancient Europe? For millions, it's a single, iconic combination, blonde hair and blue eyes. We see it in Viking sagas, in Roman descriptions of northern tribes, in fairy tales. We've become so used to seeing them together that we assume they are together, that they are one trait sprung from the same genetic source. But what if that's completely wrong? What if the story of blue eyes and the story of blonde hair are two entirely separate stories? Stories that begin thousands of miles apart in two completely different ancient peoples. In one corner of our story, a 7,000-year-old man in a Spanish cave. His genes would shock the world. In the other corner, a 17,000-year-old remnant of a lost people, hunters of the Siberian mammoth steppe. This isn't the story of one genetic master switch. This is the story of two. It's a tale of how these two unique human mutations, separated by an ice age, finally collided to create the look of a continent. To understand our story, we first have to meet our two genetic artifacts, two ancient skeletons that completely rewrote human history. Our first artifact was found in 2006 in a cold, deep cave system in the Cantabrian Mountains of northern Spain. He was a man of the Mesolithic, the Middle Stone Age. He died 7,000 years ago, one of the last hunters of his kind. They called him Labrano I. For years, our image of these ancient Europeans was just a guess. We assumed they looked like modern Europeans. When scientists managed to extract and sequence his DNA, they were expecting to find the ancestors of the modern Spanish. What they found was a ghost. The analysis was a bombshell. The man from Labrania had dark Mediterranean to North African skin, but his genes also showed, unequivocally, he had piercing blue eyes. Dark skin and blue eyes. This single discovery shattered the old assumption that light skin evolved first and then blue eyes came later. The truth was the reverse. Blue eyes were spreading through the hunter-gatherers of ancient Europe long before light skin became common. This proved that the gene for blue eyes was on its own journey. But where did it come from? Now, let's meet our second artifact. We have to travel thousands of miles east and 10,000 years further back in time, to Siberia. Here, archaeologists found the remains of a people so ancient they are known only as the Ancient North Eurasians, or A-N-E. These were the true Ice Age survivors. They hunted woolly mammoths on the frozen steppe. One 17,000-year-old individual from a site called Afontavagora gave up his genetic secrets, and his DNA showed the very first known instance of a gene mutation that would one day define Northern Europe. It wasn't for blue eyes. It was the master switch for blonde hair. So now we have our mystery. Two core traits, two separate ancient peoples. The blue-eyed hunter-gatherers of the West and the blonde-haired mammoth hunters of the East. They were separated by 10,000 years and the entire Eurasian continent. So how did their genes ever meet? To answer that, we have to follow the story of each master switch, one by one. The story of blue eyes begins with a beautiful illusion. Blue eyes don't actually contain any blue pigment. It's an optical trick. Your eye color is decided by a pigment called melanin. More melanin in your iris gives you brown eyes. Less melanin gives you blue eyes. A blue iris is like the sky. Light enters, and because there's very little melanin to absorb it, the light scatters. The shorter blue wavelengths scatter more, and that's the color reflected back at you. So the real question isn't what makes eyes blue, the real question is, what stops them from being brown? And the answer is a tiny, elegant piece of genetic machinery. It involves two genes. Think of it this way. Gene 1 is OCA2, 
This is the pigment factory. Its job is to help produce the melanin that colors your iris. Gene 2 is HERC2. This is the master switch. It sits right next to OCA2, and its job is to tell the factory how much pigment to make. For almost all of human history, every human had a switch that was flipped to on. HERC2 told OCA2 to produce lots of melanin. The result? Brown eyes. But then, somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 years ago, a single random mutation occurred in one human being. It happened in the HERC2 gene. To be specific, it's a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, known as RS1291 3832. A single letter in their DNA code changed. This single change broke the master switch. It flipped it to off. Scientifically, this mutation disrupts a small loop in the DNA's structure, a chromatin loop, that connects HERC2 to OCA2 factory. With that connection broken, HERC2 can no longer tell OCA2 to go to work. The factory slows down, melanin production in the iris plummets, and just like that, for the first time, blue eyes appeared. The most incredible part? Geneticists have studied this mutation in blue-eyed people from all over the world, from Scandinavia to Jordan, and it is exactly the same mutation. This is what's called a founder mutation. It didn't happen multiple times. It happened once. This means every single person on Earth with blue eyes is a descendant of that one single human ancestor who lived and died likely near the Black Sea. This new gene, HERC2, spread like wildfire among the hunter-gatherer populations of ancient Europe. This is the gene they found in Labrania 1. It's the gene they found in 7,700-year-old hunters in Motala, Sweden. By 7,000 years ago, the blue-eyed switch was firmly established in the native Western hunter-gatherers. They were a people of dark skin, but increasingly of blue eyes. They had one half of the puzzle, but they were still missing the blonde hair. For decades, scientists assumed that the same depigmentation genes that controlled eye color must also control hair and skin color. They were wrong. The story of blonde hair doesn't involve HERC2 or OCA2 at all. Its genetic pathway is entirely different. First, blonde hair is much more complex than blue eyes. It's a polygenic trait, meaning hundreds of different genes all contribute a small amount to the final shade. But there is one gene that acts as the primary dimmer switch for hair color. It's called KITLG. The KITLG gene is fundamental. It plays a role in everything from blood stem cells to gut development, but it also helps guide pigment-producing cells, melanocytes, to their final destination in the hair follicles. A tiny mutation near this gene, an SNP called RS1282126, can turn down the gene's activity. When the KITLG gene is turned down, fewer melanocytes make it to the hair follicle, and the result is lighter hair. A small reduction gives you brown hair. A large reduction gives you blonde hair. So where did this KITLG mutation come from? If the blue-eyed HERC2 mutation was the signature of the Western hunter-gatherers, the blonde-haired KITLG mutation was the signature of a different people entirely, the ancient North Eurasians, the ANE. These were the 17,000-year-old mammoth hunters from Siberia. This population lost to history was the source of the blonde hair mutation. They were an incredibly important group, as the Ice Age ended, they split. Some went east, across the Bering Land Bridge, and became part of the ancestry of Native Americans. Others went 
west. They moved onto the vast open plains of what is now Russia and Ukraine, the Pontic Caspian Steppe. Here, they mixed with local Eastern European hunters. This mixing created a powerful new culture, the Yamnia. The Yamnia were a revolutionary people. They were tall, nomadic pastoralists. They were among the first to master horseback riding and build wagons. They herded massive flocks of cattle, and they carried the A.N.E. blonde hair gene. So now our stage is set. The year is 5000 BC. In the West, in the forests of ancient Europe, lived the native hunter-gatherers who were carrying the blue-eyed gene. In the East, on the endless steppe, lived the Yamnia nomads who were carrying the blonde-haired gene. The two worlds were about to collide. A cinematic, educational, and slightly mysterious documentary tone. The narrator speaks with authority and a sense of wonder, guiding the viewer through 10,000 years of genetic history. Around 3000 BC, something changed. The Yamnaya, empowered by the horse and the wagon, began to move. It wasn't a small migration. It was a demographic explosion. In what is one of the largest migrations in human history, the Yamnaya swept west, out of the steppe, and deep into the heart of Europe. They brought their technology. They brought their language, the ancestor of almost all modern European languages, from English to German to Spanish. And they brought their genes. Genetic studies on ancient skeletons from this period show a complete and total transformation. In many parts of Northern Europe, the Yamnaya migration replaced over 70% of the existing population's DNA. The native Western hunter-gatherers, the people of Labrania, essentially vanished, absorbed into this new incoming population. But they didn't vanish without a trace they passed on their most unique genetic signature, the blue-eyed Hark-2 switch. And the Yamnaya, with their a &E ancestry, brought the blonde-haired hark switch. For the first time in human history, these two separate mutations, born 10,000 years and 4,000 miles apart, were united in the same gene pool. The result, was a new hybrid population, a people who now carried the genetic potential for both traits. The iconic combination was born. This new blended culture would go on to form the corded ware culture of Germany and the beaker bell culture of Britain. They are the direct ancestors of almost all modern Northern Europeans. This is why, when we look at the 7,000-year-old hunter from Spain, he has dark skin and blue eyes. And it's why when we look at a 4,000-year-old beaker woman from Scotland, her genes show lighter skin and the combination of blue eyes and blonde hair. The mystery was solved. The convergence was complete. But this leads to one final, crucial question. Why did this combination, blue eyes and blonde hair, become so incredibly common in Northern Europe? Today, there is a blue-eyed belt that stretches from Estonia, where 89% of people have blue eyes, across Finland, Sweden, and Latvia. Why there? The original mutations didn't just survive, they were actively selected for. Something about these traits gave their carriers an advantage. The most popular theory is the vitamin D hypothesis. Both traits are forms of D pigmentation. Both are linked to lighter skin. The KIT-LG gene also affects skin, and the HeRC2-OCA2 pathway is related to it. Vitamin D is essential for survival, and our primary source is sunlight. Our bodies synthesize it when UV rays hit our skin. In Africa, where humanity evolved, dark skin is a vital protection against intense UV radiation. 
But as these ancient peoples, the Omnia and the native hunters, move north to places with long dark winters and weak sun, that protection became a liability. They couldn't produce enough vitamin D. Individuals with lighter skin, lighter hair, and lighter eyes, all of which allow more UV to be absorbed, had a powerful survival advantage. They were healthier. Their children were more likely to survive. The genes for depigmentation were favored by nature. But there's a second, more intriguing theory. Sexual selection. In small, isolated, post-Ice Age populations, these traits would have been incredibly rare. A flash of blue eyes in a world of brown, a shock of blonde hair in a world of black. This rarity in itself may have made them desirable. Individuals with these striking, rare features would have stood out. They might have been seen as exotic, special, and more attractive as mates. They would have had more children, passing on their unique genes at a faster rate. The blue-eyed gene in particular has another advantage, paternity certainty. Because blue eyes are a simple recessive trait, unlike complex blonde hair, two blue-eyed parents can only have a blue-eyed child. In a prehistoric world, a brown-eyed child from two blue-eyed parents would be a clear sign of infidelity. This may have placed even more selective pressure on the trait. Finally, there's the founder effect. As small bands of these newly mixed peoples migrated, they carried a random sample of genes with them. If, just by chance, the founder of a new tribe in an isolated fjord had blue eyes and blonde hair, those genes would become incredibly common in that new population, just through drift and isolation. It was likely a combination of all three, a survival advantage from the sun, a reproductive advantage from attraction, and a random advantage from pure chance. Together, these forces took two rare mutations and made them the calling card of a continent. The story of blue eyes and blonde hair is not one story, it is two. It's the legacy of two worlds long since vanished. The world of the Western hunter-gatherers, a 10,000-year-old European culture of dark-skinned hunters who passed on their master switch for blue eyes. And the world of the ancient North Eurasians, a 17,000-year-old Siberian people who passed on their master switch for blonde hair. These traits are more than just colors. They are echoes. When you look in the mirror, what you are seeing is a living map of ancient human migration. Your eyes and hair are a testament to this great convergence, a 10,000-year-old genetic story written into your DNA by the hunters of the European forests and the mammoth slayers of the Siberian steppe. Two switches flipped at two different times in two different worlds that finally came together in you.